many options in militarism if you look at it from that point of view. On March the 13th, 1957, another revolutionary group, the Revolutionary Directorate, whose members were almost all of them students, tried to kill Batista by launching an attack on the presidential palace itself. The scheme was to capture the presidential palace by surprise and to kill Batista. But the attack was a failure. They couldn't reach the dictator because it seems that Batista's soldiers were on the alert expecting the attack and reinforcements arrived quickly, putting an end to the battle in a few hours. The leading personalities of the students' movement died in the attempt. Jose Antonio Echevarria, Carlos Guiteria, Menoya, and some others. Once more, Batista had been saved. It didn't take long before the dictator's friends went to the presidential palace personally to show him their support. Mr. President, do you have any proof that the that communists were involved in the raid on the palace? We have proof that uh, in the past, the soldiers such as Wednesday raid were sponsored by communist collaborators. Well, Mr. President, what happens next? I hope nothing happens. Nothing happens next, I hope. Batista was wrong. Firstly, it wasn't true that the directorate had any contacts with the communists. Quite the contrary, the student organization was explicitly anti-communist, its leaders being from Catholic youth ranks like Echevarria himself. And secondly, Batista was also wrong when he thought that nothing was going to happen after the attack on the presidential palace. In fact, his days were numbered. Another revolutionary leader of the fight against Batista was Dr. Martha Friday from the Marty Women's Movement. Today, she lives in exile. We realized, didn't we, the necessity of unity among all those different elements, the political, civilian, and religious groups, if we were to consolidate and have a common goal. This goal was the overthrow of the dictatorship and the setting up of a revolutionary process in Cuba. It was assumed that this revolutionary process would be based on democracy and unity. Because if we were united during the struggle, how could it be different after the triumph of the revolution? The only ones who didn't take an active part against Batista were the communists. The Cuban people have always been religious. It was a Catholic archbishop who saved Castro and his followers' lives after the attack on Moncada barracks. Many Catholics died during that attack, and others kept on fighting afterwards. At Sierra Maestra, there were several Catholic priests close to Castro who, during those years, didn't miss any opportunity to show his Christian devotion. About this, Carlos Franchi recalls, the last Fidel, the one in Sierra Maestra, I do not remember what he was like. He was a man, there are the photographs from those days, with a crucifix hanging on his neck. Not being a Catholic myself, I was surprised, next to a priest baptizing peasant children, and more often than not saying prayers. He was a man who was against the idea of nationalization, who regarded foreign investments favorably, according to his own words, which I questioned in a certain sense, because he really seemed to me a conservative, and many people within the ranks of the movement were of the same opinion, and the whole Cuban population alike. He was the son of a great landowner. He had attended schools run by Jesuits since he was six until he was 20, and those were the ideas he admitted to holding then. Starting in 1952, and even before 1952, I was a socialist. I was a Marxist-Leninist. That was my conviction and the way I had been educated. I was a communist, although not a member of a communist party, since I saw other possibilities. 
At that time, the Communist Party was very isolated. There was a lot of prejudice within our society. But still, there were large popular movements that were against corruption, bad government. As yet, they had no revolutionary political consciousness, but they were very rebellious. There was a lot of opposition to the prevailing situation of corruption, unemployment, poverty, and exploitation among the masses of farmers and workers within the middle classes and among the students. But as yet there was no socialist or Marxist-Leninist culture. I had it. And so did a group within the main nucleus of leaders. I myself was the preacher of those ideas within that nucleus. Even before our attack on the Moncada, we got together. We had study circles. We studied the works of Lenin and Marx and Mehring's biography of Marx. I recall that in those days, before the Moncada, Mehring's biography of Karl Marx was one of the books we read in our study circles. It would mean exactly the same thing to him if Hitler had said he was a Nietzschean, that is to say, Castro had no idea who Marx was, at least at the time he was referring to. He was just a gangster in Havana who was always carrying a gun. Everybody saw him, and all of us who knew him then saw that gun. He carried it under his jacket, and he never had a book in his hands. So I was taken aback by those famous Marxist studies of his, as much as he himself must have been saying it on the Spanish television, which, by the way, is commonplace in the communist world. And it isn't only rebuilding history, rewriting history, but also recomposing biographies, something which is being done by many people in Cuba, where time and time again people are concocting a past which has never existed, just as if they were all trying to realize great literary ambitions. Journalist Jose Pardo Giada, standing next to Castro when the latter was 18 years old. Pardo Giada was one of Castro's closest friends at the time. From his post as Colombian ambassador in Oslo, he evokes those years. When I'm asked that question, and I have been asked indeed about Fidel Castro, whether he is a communist or when he became a communist, he sometimes says he was acquainted with Marxism-Leninism since he was a boy, and I recall images of my relationship with Fidel since his adolescence. It's known that Fidel wanted to be a member of the House of Representatives by people's vote when Cuba was a democratic country. That is, he didn't have the idea of waging an armed revolution then. But perhaps there's an antecedent which is much more interesting and enlightening about the true feelings Fidel may have had during his youth. When I was a leader of the People's Party in Cuba, I bought the complete set of Benito Mussolini's speeches. And one day, Fidel came to my house. He was a youngster aged about 18 by then. He came to my house and saw that I had the 12 volumes of the Spanish edition of Mussolini's speeches and writings. And he told me, I'm taking them away. Lend them to me. And I said to him, I can't lend them to you. I've just bought them. And this is what Fidel did. With the $100 he was sent monthly by his father, Fidel had just got married, with $100 sent by his father, he bought a copy of the same set, which he got somewhat cheaper, paying only $90 for it, and with the remaining $10, he bought a huge piece of cheese for his wife, and they had to eat cheese for 15 days. Who is Fidel Castro really? As a boy, he studied at a Jesuit school in Santiago de Cuba, and since